Good morning. The opening words this morning are by Vanessa Rush Southern, a Unitarian Universalist minister, and with the theme of this morning and the theme of the annual pledge drive being Growing Our Garden, uh, the annual pledge drive committee asked me, Tom, do you have any readings about gardens? And I said, oh, oh, do I ever. You're going to have, you're going to have tomatoes and scallions growing out of your ears by the end of the morning. And uh, so here's one of those. I recall the reflection that my friend and my colleague Vanessa had written about the spiritual lessons of planting a garden with the children of her church, and it's entitled, This Peace of Eden. The children in my church and I planted a garden this spring. Now, in late summer, a tall sunflower stands over the patch, entertaining bees in its crown. There is a fountain of zinnias and, until recently, a cucumber plant with imperialist zeal. Little seeds have blossomed into parsley and tomatoes, and other small seedling plants have dropped their roots deep and fast and seem ready to stay. I love this garden. It's a metaphor for so much. We started it to illustrate the biblical parable of the mustard seed, and it served this purpose well. Strong, proud, and lush plants have grown from tiny, unpretentious seeds. They remind us of the ability of small things to surprise us and stand in for the faith that begins inconspicuously. There is the plant of which neither the facilities manager nor I know the origin. Tall and fierce, it violates every aesthetic of this garden and would have been uprooted long ago had we not been intimidated by its conviction that it belonged. Just when we confirmed that this visitor was indeed a weed, it flowered. In a gesture pure and simple, a wash of pale blossoms, it made its case. There was a place for the uninvited and unplanned in this garden. The garden isn't pure miracle. Our facilities manager has religiously tended to its needs. He waters it twice a day and has laid a metal fence to protect it against wayward feet. Moreover, it has suffered losses, like the little plants that wilted in a May heat wave. Still, for only a few seeds, the efforts of some dedicated but largely inexperienced planters and regular care and tending, there are color and life where once there was none. Where is there some dry ground around you that you know of? This piece of Eden proves that we can bring the plainest soil to life. I told you there would be a lot of mentions of gardens this morning. So I want to do, um, I didn't do this at the first service. Uh, I, I did it, but it surprised them. So I'm going to give you all fair warning um, that at a couple points during the sermon today, it, we're going to do it in kind of a dialogue fashion um, where I'm going to bring the, the microphone down and engage it with, in dialogue and kind of ask questions. And if people feel like responding, you can do that. At, at the first service, I actually said um, incorrectly, I said, I said, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be like Jerry Springer. And that, and that brought a lot of like, it, it, nervous laughter, um, and so someone someone said someone said when you said that that what I what I pictured was you actually like throwing a chair. I think you meant Phil Donahue, and so I said I'll be I'll be like Phil Donahue. Um, come on. My daughter, age three, has been on something of a kick about growing lately. Uh, She enjoys getting measured to see how tall she is and how much she has grown. You know, pencil across the head on the door frame. (laughs) Along with this interest in seeing how tall she is, um, she's begun to announce, more or less out of the blue, things that she's looking forward to doing when she's older. Not long ago, she announced to us that when she's older, she's going to babysit. The other day at the dinner table, she said that when she's older, she plans to eat spicy food. Um, And repeatedly, she's boasted that when she grows up, she's going to be taller than daddy. I don't have the heart to break it to her that she probably didn't win the genetic lottery. This morning's service um, is entitled Growing Our Garden. And Growing Our Garden, it's the theme of this year's uh, pledge drive, which kicks off today and, and which I probably say a few words about. Um, inspired by all of the readings and music, um, there's going to be a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about gardens. Um, at least I'm going to talk about gardens metaphorically. 
um, you probably don't want to listen to actual uh, advice about actual gardening from me since I'm probably, I thought I was the worst gardener in the world until about 14 months ago when um, the board gave all the members of the staff these potted plants um, for the holidays and, and I'm actually the only one on the staff who hasn't killed his plant. Um, and and I, tease, I tease Marion and Andrea, I give them a hard time about it, um, perhaps more than they, more than they wish. Um, but yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert gardener, so gardens are metaphor. Um, so I'll talk about the pledge drive and about gardens as metaphor, but really what I wanna talk about this morning is, is growth. And when I say growth, I'm gonna talk about a particular aspect of growth. When people talk about growth in churches, the first thing they expect to hear about, and which I don't plan to spend time on, is numbers. How many members, how many youth in the youth group, how many dollars in the budget. But actually, the people who've written about kind of healthy church institutions, they talk about four different categories of growth. One of those four is numerical growth, how many, what's the average Sunday worship? Are people signing up for covenant groups? Are, are people raising their pledges? But people who write about and study church growth actually say that numerical growth is less important and can be less faithful than the other kinds. My colleague, Barbara Merritt, has used the term avaricious numerical accounting. I invite you to say that with me. Avaricious numerical accounting to describe our human tendency to try to quantify and compare and rank things when doing that may not be really healthy for our spirits. Um, and Barbara Merritt actually introduced that term, avaricious numerical accounting, in order to scold ministers who get competitive about membership. To scold ministers who get competitive about membership. How many members do you have? Is your church growing? What size is your church? And she says that, that avaricious numerical accounting is spiritually unhealthy when ministers do it, but it's something that, that a lot of people do that anybody can get caught up in. And so I'd ask you to think about maybe is there anything in your life that you get kind of caught on trying to measure or quantify and causes you grief? How many square feet is in your house compared to your neighbor's house? What's your GPA or your class rank? How many likes did that Facebook post get? A few people, a few, there was a few chuckles at the first service about that. How many carrots are in that ring? You can probably think of some number, some quantity, some measurement that becomes an obsession, a preoccupation, a jealousy in your life to the detriment of what matters. That's called avaricious numerical accounting. And so the people who write about church growth are more interested in other types of growth. A second kind of growth that they talk about is called organic or organizational growth. This has to do with the capacity of a church or any organization, its systems and infrastructure, communication and leadership development. Organic growth is about the task of building community, fashioning structures, developing practices and processes that result in a dependable and stable network of human relationships in which we can and from which we can make a difference. A third type of growth that they write about is called missional or incarnational growth. And this idea of growth has to do with the ability of the church to live its mission beyond its walls, whether that means serving the hungry, educating the community, or creating a more just society. This type of growth has to do with our impact in incarnating a better world with less suffering and more justice. And uh, out in the commons today, after the service, um, there's going to be a bunch of tables set up for our ministries fair. And uh, today, fittingly, are our social justice and community service ministries. And so you'll get to visit some of their tables and see about how they're doing at, at incarnating a more uh, beloved world. To apply a garden metaphor, numerical growth would be how many tomatoes and zucchini your garden produces. Organic and organizational growth has to do with all the systems and activities that are necessary to properly tend the garden. If you have a couple tomato plants in your front yard, all you'll need is a watering can. But if you have a whole backyard plot, uh, that watering can is going to lead to frustration, so you'll need a hose. Or if you have an entire farm, you need an irrigation system. And then missional or incarnational growth has to do with how many hungry people you're able to feed, how many soup kitchens you're able to supply, and so on. 
But there's also a fourth kind of growth, a fourth kind of growth, and this is the kind of growth that I want to talk about this morning. This type of growth is called maturational growth or spiritual growth. It has to do do with how we grow in the maturity of our faith, how we deepen our spiritual roots, and how we expand and enlarge our religious imagination. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. This type of growth is probably the hardest to measure. You can't, as I do for my daughter, just sort of put you up against a wall and, and draw a line and know where you stand. What does spiritual growth mean? What does spiritual maturity mean? And so I'd be interested in, here's where I'm going to be, Phil Donahue, I'm kind of interested in our collective wisdom. What are the signs that you would look for in someone who you would call spiritually mature? What would you look for as evidence of spiritual growth? What does, what does spiritual growth mean? What would, you, what would you say as a quality of someone, of someone who's, who's spiritually grown? What would that look like? Anybody want to be... Anybody want to be brave? Don't let the first service outdo you. Yeah. Joan. Someone who's participating in one of these things, sharing, listening, wondering, rejoicing. I forgot the last. Sharing, listening, wondering, rejoicing. That's, that's a pretty good list. That's a great list. Anybody else want to want to be bold, brave? Yeah, Keenan. Selflessness. Kate. Someone who exudes or strives for unconditional love. All right, name anybody in the room? Yeah, Lila. Patience. Patience. Patience and, and Ruth, I'll let you be the last. Someone who hasn't perhaps quite gotten to the point where they exude unconditional love yet, but where they are brightly and enthusiastically committed to their own faith and just as enthusiastically committed to other people expressing theirs without having to convert them. Oh, cool. Oh. <coughs> you all did well. At the, at the first service, I had... Uh... I had a few moments of really awkward silence as people were, people were kind of surprised there. My, um, my colleague, Kendall Gibbons, has actually created a list of 12 qualities and characteristics that she considers to be signs of spiritual maturity. And though, as in pulling together this list of 12, um, she's taken them from world religions, from Greek philosophy, from humanism, and from our own Unitarian Universalist living tradition. So would anybody be interested in hearing her 12 sort of signs of spiritual maturity? Um, I got a couple nods, which is good, because if you said, no, we don't want to hear it, I, I, don't, know what I, I don't know what I do. I shouldn't even ask the question. Um, and, and don't preach it. All right, thanks. And so I don't, and don't write them, and don't write them down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I'm going to post them on, on Facebook and make sure they're available elsewhere. So here are, here are Kendall Gibbon's 12 signs of spiritual maturity. And I'm going to, I'll list them off. The first is, um, it's from, it's from the word from the Greek. It's sophrosin, which means self-awareness and, and understanding oneself in the, sense of, in the sense of know thyself. Self-awareness in the service of intention. Second for her, the second category of spiritual maturity is a willingness to offer leadership and service. Her third sign is fluency in the use of metaphor. Fluency in the use of metaphor. Her fourth sign of spiritual maturity is a perspective of gratitude, wonder, blessing, and generosity, which is like almost exactly the same as what Joan said. Fifth, I love this, she says, fifth sign is a tolerance for intensity and ambiguity. A tolerance for intensity and ambiguity. Her sixth sign of spiritual maturity is um, it's taken from the Lakota tradition, Native American. It's a mitake oyasin, which means 
a perception of universal connectedness. Perception of universal connectedness. Her seventh is Islam, which she defines as the serene surrender to reality. Being serenely surrendered to reality. The eighth from the Jewish tradition is Teshuvah, or the capacity to acknowledge error and change. Ninth from the Buddhist tradition is Tong Len, which it means the ability to be in the presence of pain and suffering without panic. The pre- ability to be in the presence of pain without panic. Tenth, memento mori, the consistent acceptance of mortality. Consistent acceptance of mortality. Eleventh is fidelity to covenant, faithfulness to our commitments and our promises. And twelfth is, um, for Kendall says, the twelfth sign of spiritual maturity is attraction to beauty, to mercy, and to justice. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. So what my colleague Kendall is doing with this project is nothing new. She actually credits St. Paul as her inspiration. Um, It was Paul who, in his letter to the Galatians, offered a list of what he called fruits of the spirit. There's another garden metaphor for you, or at least an orchard one. And the fruits of the Spirit, according to Paul in Galatians, are love, joy, peace, gentleness, forbearance, and self-control. Kendall's project is also influenced by her attempt to understand common attributes expressed and evidenced by people the world around who we would identify as spiritually mature and deeply courageous. She writes, it's obvious to anyone who has any historical or international awareness that there is something that the world's most acknowledged spiritual leaders have in common. Some attributes that characterize the Gandhis and Dalai Lamas and Mother Teresas and Martin Luther Kings of the world, no matter what historical religious tradition they identify with. And of course, these qualities are not limited to those who achieve wide recognition. They exist as well in the French villagers who hid Jews from the Nazis, in Rwandan hotel keepers, in neighbors and teachers and elders everywhere who exemplify for us what it means to grow into the radical acceptance of others, self-awareness, active compassion, and sacrificial love that are the highest expressions of any faith. Kind of lofty sentiments there. And so I want to do just a little bit of um, a little bit of Phil Donahue again, and I'm kind of curious in this question: How does this church, or how has this church, this congregation, this this community, encouraged spiritual growth in you? How have you how have you grown in in your, your in your spiritual growth from being part of this community? Does anybody feel does anybody feel comfortable kind of uh, giving, a quick, uh, giving a quick testimony? Anybody, anybody willing to share? How have you changed or transformed? Hand, yeah, look at that. I see a brave hand, and it's, it's John. I think uh, I've grown in terms of peace, acceptance. Grown in terms of peace and acceptance. A hand over here. Um, I think my sense of community has grown. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Bill. I think this church has allowed me, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, uh, serve and also to enhance my sense of social justice. Serve and sense of social justice. And I'm going to get one more down, down here in the front. This is a worship service for the... Pete, Peter, are you raising your hand? No. Oh, Pete, Pete's like, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> Let the record show Pete is not raising his hand. Um, I used to always say that I'd like to come to service because it was the one hour of a week that I'm not talking because I have four kids. So um, I've really learned to 
kind of meditate through the hour, and, and really my listening skills have increased dramatically, and it has helped me in personal relationships. Thanks, Margaret. So I will uh, say that um, after, the, after the first service in coffee hour, a bunch of people came up and said, oh, we, we like that pass the mic thing that you did. And, and, I, and I said to them, you were, the, you were the one trying to avoid eye contact when I was, when I was walking around. So I'll, um, I'll conclude. I'll conclude this morning with these, with these words of benediction. As you go forth today, be attentive to the growth of your spirit and to the health of your soul. Don't get stuck in trying to worry about others, worry about measuring things that are not healthy. Instead, give your attention and your whole self to those qualities and those characteristics that bring you the deepest sense of peace, the deepest sense of acceptance, the deepest sense of love. I invite you to cultivate this spiritual sense into generosity and to bless the world even as you are blessed. Go forth in peace and go forth in joy.